Well, we are indeed living in times of uncertainty. And furthermore, there is much confusion among many believers today. People are asking, what is the significance of what's going on in Israel? Does it have prophetic significance? Is it a end time event? Where are we on God's prophetic calendar? And in this first study, what I'd like to do is give you an order of events. We're going to see what are the major events that's going to happen in the last days. How do we know that we have arrived in the last days? And what should we be doing in order to prepare for these things? It's been very common because of this conflict in Israel that many people have opened up their Bible and looked for Gaza and to see what does the word of God say about it. And the first place I'd like to begin to see me is in the book of Zephaniah. Now, if you were at our conference last year, you will remember that we studied the entire book of Zephaniah. And we looked at the same passage that I'd like to speak on just for a few moments. And that is Zephaniah chapter 2. And the important verse is verse 4. Because there is where Gaza is mentioned. And if you go back and listen to that message from last year, I shared with you that this prophecy, for the most part, has already been fulfilled. When we look at Gaza, or Ashkelon, or Ashdod, or Gat, or Ekron, these are five Philistine cities. And the Philistines were a mighty enemy of Israel. They stood against King David and wanted to thwart God's purposes for that land and for his people. But we see in this second chapter, God is saying something. And that is that he has defeated these places. And today, when we look at them, we find that four of the five are controlled by Israel and have Jewish inhabitants. And what we're supposed to glean from this is this. When we look later on in the book of Zephaniah, when we go to that last chapter in verse 14, it speaks about Zion. And Zion is a kingdom word. And therefore, people have wrongly looked at this whole passage and said, it's about the last days. It is not. What Zephaniah is doing is this. He's giving the people encouragement. He's telling them in the same way that in the past, God defeated the Philistines. And these cities that were once enemy cities, now they are under your leadership. And what God is promising is in the last days that he is going to remind us of his faithfulness by giving us victory as he has given victory to Israel in the past. Let me give you another example of what the word of God does. This time in the book of Revelation and chapter 20. Now, you'll recall that this 20th chapter has to do with the millennial kingdom. And in verse 7, we see something. That millennial kingdom has come to an end. And it's necessary, the word of God says, that Satan be released from his prison. And he goes out and does what, what the enemy always does, and that is to deceive. And it's interesting because it says here that he goes out into the four corners, that is, in four directions, north, south, east, and west, in order to deceive. Now think about this for a moment. There has been 1,000 years of righteous rule. Messiah has sat on the throne from the holy city of Jerusalem. And he has brought about and established a kingdom of righteousness, justice. And when there is sin, that sin has been punished. And when people seek forgiveness, 
They remember the sacrifice of Messiah, that cross that he bore in order that people could experience forgiveness and God's grace. And then it says that this, this enemy is going to go out and deceive. And there's going to be a multitude that is not able to be counted. And then we have Gog and Magog mentioned. Now, why is that? We know biblically that that battle that's spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 is before the millennial kingdom. So why is Gog and Magog mentioned after the millennial kingdom? Well, for that same purpose. In the same way that God was victorious over the enemies that came against Israel, Gog and Magog, that term is brought into a new context, but with the same purpose, and that is to inform us of a future victory. God won the battle of Gog and Magog, and he will also defeat Satan and that great multitude that will be deceived by him to attack the saints in the holy city. So there is a biblical principle, and that is that when we use Scripture and we see the proper context, we can take that and give hope to others by referring to them God's faithfulness in history. Our God is indeed a faithful God throughout all generations. And then we see something else in the word of God. We see that in the scripture, there's going to be an increase in the influence of Iran. I'd like now to look at another scripture, a scripture that we spoke of some years ago. And that is from the book of Daniel and chapter 8. Now, I would suggest to you that this eighth chapter of Daniel is one of the most relevant scriptures for understanding what is going on today. Yes, this battle is in Gaza, but we find that the real force behind Hamas, the real force behind Hezbollah, the real force that brings instability, not just in the Middle East, but prophetically will do so throughout the world, will be Iran. And what is so tragic is this, that so many commentators, and I would invite you not to trust what I'm saying, but, but look and study this chapter online, and you will find that the vast majority of Christian commentators will put Daniel chapter 8 in the past. And they will say that it has to do with, with Alexander the Great in that period of time. This is not biblically correct. And let me give you some proof of that. Look with me, as I said, to Daniel chapter 8. And I want you to look at verse 17. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 17. Because when we look at this verse, it says at the end here that this vision, it says, Le'et ket he chazon, which means this, that this vision is for the end time. That's exactly how we translate that at the end of verse 17. And then if you go into verse 19, it tells you that this prophecy in Daniel chapter 8, which deals with two empires, we'll talk about that in a moment. Notice that it says in verse 19, which means this prophecy is going to bring about the end of God's wrath in this world. That is an end time event, not something in the past having nothing to do with Alexander the Great. And then if you look at the end of verse 19, it says, Ki le moed. And most of you know that word, moed. It has to do with an appointed time. So it says for and the appointed time. And then notice how that verse ends with the word ketz, which is the Hebrew word for end, meaning that this prophecy is for the appointed end time. So three times we are told by Daniel 
in verses 17 and 19 that this chapter is for the end times. But so frequently we see both Jewish commentators and Christian commentators putting it in the past. They should not. Now, when you study Daniel chapter 8, you will find that there are two beasts mentioned. And that first beast is called the ram. And we don't have to speculate who that ram is. Because again, if you go to the word of God, we are told in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 20, where it says, the ram which you saw that is having horns are the kings of Medes and the Persians. Now, the Medes and the Persians represent an ancient empire in the land that we're calling today Iran. And therefore, when we look at Daniel chapter 8, we should anticipate something. And we're seeing the beginning of that right now, and that is this, that there's going to be an empire, we can think of it another way, a coalition of nations that is going to come together in that same location where we have modern day Iran. And this empire is known as the Ram. And what is it going to do? It is going to bring about, and hear this carefully, it is going to bring about worldwide instability. That's what we can expect. And that's what we're seeing today. Now, today, what's going on, in my opinion, is just the beginning of what this prophecy is going to reveal. And that is an Iran that grows in power, grows in influence, and we're seeing this even today. We see that Iran has great influence in Lebanon, in Syria, in Yemen. Many of you know that the, those who are faithful to Iran in Yemen, they have fired rockets towards Israel in the last few days. And Iran is an destabilizing influence. That's what the scripture tells us. So we can anticipate Iran becoming a greater source of instability in the world. And remember that word, instability. But when Daniel received that prophecy, he also saw another, another beast, meaning another empire. And that empire was the goat. Now, what I want to do in the time that we have left tonight, and it's a significant amount of time, is that I want us to see an order of events so that we're not confused, that we're not misled by, by others, but rather we know what is going to happen in the future. And as we, as we're commanded by Messiah himself, as we see these things beginning, we should be encouraged. We should understand that all of these things are necessary. In fact, Messiah uses a word, a very important word. And it speaks about something that must happen in order for God's will to be established. And in the last days, he speaks of several events which must be. And therefore, we should not be fearful. We should not be confused. We should not allow these things to turn us away from where God would have us to be and what he would have us to do. So where is where are we today in the prophetic calendar? We are in Daniel chapter 8, where Iran is growing in influence where they're going to bring about a great source of fear and hopelessness. Because when you study chapter 8, what it says about the ram, who is Iran, and a coalition of other nations with it, it is going to accomplish initially what Iran wants. And therefore, the people are going to be hopeless. It's going to grow this empire. But this is not the empire of the Antichrist. And as bad as this empire is, we're going to see something. 
we're going to see that another empire, which is called the goat, will emerge. And when we study Daniel chapter 8, we learn something. It is that goat empire that is the Antichrist empire. Now, we know something about that, that Antichrist empire. You read, for example, Revelation chapter 13, and we'll be looking at that later on this weekend. You will find that this Antichrist empire receives power and authority from who? From Satan. And therefore, we're seeing today Iran in its influence spreading out throughout the Middle East. But we're told something more than that. We are told that that Iran is going to go out of the east to the west, to the north, and to the south. And he is going to bring about hopelessness. He is going to grow, and he is going to accomplish for a moment his objectives. And then what? And then we will see another empire emerge from where? Well, here again. Let's not speculate. What does the word of God say? Look again at the scripture. Look, if you would, to Daniel 8 and verse 21, where it speaks about this goat is the king of Yavan. Now, your Bible will say Greece, and that's fine. But that word Yavan doesn't speak in Daniel's time of just one nation that we would call Greece, but it speaks, it's a word that has to do with Europe. And that is why we know, based upon Daniel chapter 8 and this verse, that the Antichrist empire will be coming out of Europe. So, where are we? We are seeing Iran grow and blossom into an evil force in this world. And we can anticipate in the future, that Iran, with all of its instability, that that it is going to not succeed. But another empire is going to destroy it. You read in Daniel chapter 8 about this goat, and this goat has supernatural power. You say, where is that seen in the scripture? Because the goat, he is able to move across the land without touching it. And we see that the sages of old taught that this is an Old Testament way of speaking of its supernatural character. That in the ancient times, you could not travel without touching the ground. And what it's saying here is that this is going to be an empire. This goat, this Antichrist empire is going to have supernatural power. And this empire is going to destroy the ram. Now, where are we? Well, when we look at the scripture, we find something. We find that this empire known as Iran is going to bring great instability, chaos into the world. And therefore, we should expect something. We should expect the same things that Messiah said. Because if you look at the word of God, you find, for example, let's look at the scripture. Look with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 24, the book of Matthew and chapter 24. Now, here we see that Messiah is speaking about something, and that is birth pains. Now, some have tried to make a distinction between birth pains and label pains In the word of God, there is no distinction. So why does Messiah speak about birth pains? Because birth pains have a purpose. There is something that's going to be brought about. And that is an outcome that is full of joy. So it's a difficult journey, but it ends well. And therefore, if you look at Matthew 24 and verse 4, Notice that Messiah is speaking to his disciples. And what does he say? And Yeshua answered, and he said to them. Now, even though he's speaking to his disciples nearly 2,000 years ago, 
This has relevance for disciples in the last days. When these events that we're going to be speaking about, when they are taking place. And notice what he says. He answered and said to them the first thing, watch. Now, I want you to remember that word, watch. It's interesting because in the New Testament, Messiah spoke this word and he used three different Greek words in order to tell his disciples to watch. So we're supposed to be watching. That's so important. And what are we supposed to be walking, watching for? Well, remember what he says. He says, when you see these things beginning, so we're supposed to be watching for events. Now, let me pause for a moment and tell you this, that, that tomorrow in the second message, we're going to be examining a doctrine that is very important to some. And that's known as the doctrine of the imminency. And what does that mean? Well, we'll be talking great in detail about it tomorrow, but the doctrine of the imminency means this, that the rapture can happen at any time and that there are no events that must happen prior to it. Now, there can be events that happen prior to it, but there does not have to be. Let me simply say to you that I reject the doctrine of the imminency. We do not see that supported. So what we're going to do tomorrow is look at the primary verses that, that some will say support this doctrine. I think when we look at it, we'll find that it does not support it. We will find that it is in no way a biblical truth. But we'll save that for tomorrow. But when we look at the scripture, Messiah commands us in three different Greek words to watch. Now, this first one is a word which means to be observing, pay attention, be on the lookout. So he says, watch that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name. Now imagine that. Those who are going to be deceiving are those who come in Messiah's name. And not only do they come in his name, but notice what else. They also say that I am, meaning that Yeshua is the Messiah. So they come in his name and they agree that Yeshua is the Messiah. Now, that's true. He is. We all know this. But understand that the deception is going to come from within the body of believers. And I see that so much today. Because instead of studying to show yourselves approved, instead of leaning not on your own understanding, but on the word of God, what I hear so often is that people simply repeat what they are hearing, what they are taught, and they do not check it out. My hope is this, that everything that I share, that you will be making notes and that you will check it out to see, am I speaking truth to you? Are these things clearly biblical that I'm going to be sharing with you? So Messiah says, don't let anyone deceive you. For many will come in my name saying that I am the Messiah. And notice it says here, and many, that's what's emphatic. That's what's being emphasized. And many, and this word for being deceived, if you do a good study of it, it speaks about being led astray, meaning being led into immorality. Those things that do not represent or relate to the character of God. And we're going to see what that is referring to is this Antichrist empire. Remember that the Antichrist is called the man of lawlessness. And that is, he is someone who hates the righteousness of God. So he says, and many will be led astray. He says, but 
you are about to hear of wars and rumors of war. And what does he command us? He says, see that you are not troubled. Don't be afraid of these things. See that you are not troubled. Why? He says that important word. For all these things must come about, but the end is not yet. Now, that word end is very important. You need to ask yourself, if you're going to have an opinion about the last days, you need to ask yourself, what end is he referring to? And all too often, people are simply careless. They will not do the required work that's necessary. Very few people do not know that this word for the end is different than what we saw the disciples asking in verse 3. When they say, when will these things be? And what is the sign of your coming? And at the end of verse 3, they say, and the end of the age. Now, even though almost all Bibles translate this the same way, it is a different word. It has that same root, but there's a different preposition. The word end that Messiah spoke a few minutes ago, it doesn't have that preposition at all. It's speaking about a specific end. And what was Messiah referring to? Well, he spoke about this end several times. He does, for example, in, in the verse that we're mentioning, he does again in verse 13 and verse 14 as well. And the end that Messiah is referring to is the end of the church age. We'll see evidence for that later on. But when the disciples said, when is the end of the age? They use a different word. One that speaks about everything coming to a conclusion at one time. So they're speaking about a different end. They want to know when Messiah is coming to establish his kingdom. But Messiah, and this is an important principle, Messiah spoke to his disciples. And what he revealed had to do with them. And by the way, John, in the book of Revelation, he speaks primarily to believers, the end time disciples. He doesn't speak primarily to what some will call tribulation saints. In fact, I would suggest to you that we are not going to see, as some teach, any tribulation saints. Again, we'll talk more about that on, on Shabbat. But let me just simply say that we need to be very careful with the terminology that we use and make sure that it's a biblical terminology. So he says here, for these things must come about, but the end is not yet. For nations, and this means one ethnic group will rise up against another ethnic group, kingdom, and this would be more like a country against country. And there will be, he says here, famines. And also, if you have a good Bible, it will also say pestilence. Now, most Bibles today do not use the Texas Receptus. But here's the reason why some Bibles don't have pestilence in this verse. Because the word for famine, and hear this, is the word limoi. But the word for pestilence is loi moi. And what happened because of the great similarities between these two words? Some manuscripts left one out. And unfortunately, so many of the Bibles today go with a Greek manuscript that emphasizes the differences that are in an inferior version of the Greek New Testament. When we look at the Texas Receptus, it says here, for there will be famines and there will be pestilence and there will be earthquakes in various places. And then he says, and all of these things are only the beginning of the birth pains. And then look at verse 9. 
at verse 9. And notice, it's a continuation. It says in verse 9, then they will deliver you. Who's he speaking to? Disciples. What disciples? Believers. He says, then they will deliver you over to. And the word in Greek is thalipsis. It's in the accusative thalipsin. And it means tribulation. So Messiah is saying something here. That believers are going to be persecuted. And what I would say to you is this. That on the horizon, and we'll talk about exactly when, there is going to be the worst time of persecution first for believers. Now, let's go back to this timing of these events. So it begins with the Iranian Empire rising up and being a source of problems, troubles, and instability. And we see that Messiah talked about birth pains. And what I would share with you is this, that these birth pains that he's speaking of will come before, and hear this, before Daniel's 70th week. Now, why is that? Because we're going to see biblical evidence that when the Antichrist empire comes upon the scene, and defeats the ram, he is going to bring about a time of stability. And we'll talk about why that is later on. But he is going to bring about stability. But it's going to be stability that is rooted in unrighteousness, rooted in those things which are extremely displeasing to God. So, again, we need the right picture for these events. The first thing that happens before Daniel's 70th week. Now, we'll talk more in a later message about Daniel's 70th week. We know that Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 had a prophecy of 70 weeks. Now, if you look at that ninth chapter, he doesn't speak about days. What is emphasized is years. So we're not talking about a week, meaning seven days, but we're talking about a prophetic week. And by the way, if we're talking about days, weeks would be the term Shavuot. But if we're talking about a prophetic week of seven years, it's a different word. It's Shavuim. So two different words because you're speaking about two different types of weeks. And so there's a period of the final seven years. And so what we're talking about now is before Daniel's 70th week, before those final seven years. And what's going to precede them? Biblically, Iran. Iran is going to be defeated, but because of Iran, we're going to see worldwide instability that's going to be brought about not only because of Iran and the coalition of, of nations with it, but because of other wars, because of ethnic troubles, tribal conflicts, because of earthquakes, because of famines, because of pestilence. But in the end, what can we expect? We can expect that the Antichrist empire brings about a time of stability, a false stability. And what is the Antichrist going to want to do? Well, he is going to want to court Israel to him, meaning this, he is against the purposes of God. And he knows something much better than much of the church, and that's this. So much of the church believes that God is finished with Israel, that he has replaced Israel, and there's no more significance to that land or the Jewish people. That is a false teaching. We see so many places in the scripture that we should, as Paul does, and we'll talk more about this in a later message, that we should be like Paul and anticipate 
a future restoration of the Jewish people to God through faith in Messiah. That is going to happen and is going to happen in a mighty way in the end times. And what we need to realize is that the Antichrist is going to have a commitment to Jerusalem. He is going to want a temple to be built. And he is going to want sacrifices and offerings in that temple as he tries to show that he is, first, the Jewish Savior. And secondly, he will show himself falsely that he is the God of Israel. Now, as he brings about stability, and he will, and this is going to begin in Daniel's 70th week, those final seven years, he is going to bring about stability throughout the world. He is going to bring about prosperity throughout the world. And people are going to be pleased with his leadership. But there's going to be one group that recognize the Antichrist for who he is. Now, a later study that we're going to do during this conference is a study on a question. And that is this. Will the church see the Antichrist? Now, before you answer, let's look at what the Word of God will say. And we'll do that in another message during our conference. But the Antichrist, he is going to be active. He is going to be seemingly successful. He is going to bring about many seemingly good things in the world. But what is the character of that Antichrist empire? Well, he is called the man of lawlessness. And we know something else, that he is going to, that empire, have a blasphemous character. Read what the scripture says about the Antichrist empire in Revelation chapter 13. And because of that character of unrighteousness, because of this lawlessness that he is going to bring about as the man of lawlessness, it's going to be believers that speak up against him. And that's why it says, look again in Matthew 24, Matthew 24 and verse 9. That's why it says, then they will deliver you into tribulation. And they will kill you and you will be hated by all the nations. Why? On account of my name. And then it talks about here how that there's going to be many who stumble. And what the scripture is saying is this, that there's going to be many because of this persecution, because of this, this hardship that believers are going to go through because of the unrighteousness of the Antichrist. Because of this, many are going to stumble. We need to be praying now that we don't do that. That we remain faithful and that we turn to him and rely upon the Holy Spirit for the strength to overcome all of these things. Now, I want to go to another place in the scripture. And that is in the book of Revelation and chapter 6. The book of Revelation and chapter 6. Now, we're going to go through several chapters over this weekend in the book of Revelation. And we're going to see that it speaks clarity to the reader. In Revelation chapter 6, we see that there are those seals. Now, these seals, although it's the lamb that opens them up because he is sovereign God. He is in control. But he is not the source of what's going on in these seal judgments. For the next few minutes, I want to focus in on the first four very quickly. Revelation chapter 6, look with me to verse 1. John is speaking and he says, and he's in heaven when he's seeing these visions. He says, and I looked, and when the lamb opened up, one of the seals, 
I heard one of the four living creatures. These four living creatures are in heaven saying as thunder. What did that one living creature say? Come and see. He says, and I looked and behold a white horse. Now, this white horse had one who was sitting upon it, and it was given to this one a bow. Now, this represents a weapon. So what we should expect is that there's coming one who has a weapon, and he is going to use that weapon. And notice, he is going to have a degree of power because it's given to him also a crown. And what does he do? He goes out with this authority and this weapon, and he goes out to conquer and that he should conquer. That is an expression in Greek meaning he's going to be successful. So we see that there's one who's going to go out and be successful conquering other nations. And what is he going to do? Well, look at verse, verse 3. And when he opened up the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, again, come and see. And went out another horse, but this horse was red. And the one who sat upon it, it was given to him to take peace from the earth. Now, what this is telling us is that this one, and they all work together, these four horsemen that we're going to be speaking about, all have a common purpose. And we see that he is going to conquer. He is going to take peace from the earth. And notice something else. In order that they slay one another. And it was given to him. And remember this. It was given to him a great sword. That's going to be very important. Verse, verse 5. The third horseman. And when he opened up the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, come and see. And I looked and behold, a black horse and the one that was sitting upon it, having a scale in its hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the living creatures, these four living creatures. And what did it say? Well, we have a word here that speaks about a measurement that is less than a quart of a dry substance. So it's not a great deal. And it says this measure of wheat, it costs a denaria. Now, denaria, as most of you know, is a full day's wage. So the price of food has soared for just enough wheat to be able to make a loaf of bread, you have to work an entire day. And then it says three measures of barley for a denarius. Now, notice how it concludes. Food prices are soaring. What would cause food prices to soar? Well, they soar when there's famines, when there's earthquakes, and when there's pestilence. All of these contribute adversely to the economy, and it causes food prices to go up. But notice something here. It says, do not harm the oil. That could relate to the anointing or to the wine, and wine represents in the scripture frequently joy. So in the midst of this, the anointing is not going to be harmed, nor is our joy based upon these material things that God can teach us and cause us to have that peace that passes all understanding. But here's where it gets interesting, that fourth horseman. Verse 7, and when he opened up the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. And I looked and behold, a horse. Now, here again, I do not know why that so frequently things are mistranslated. 
But if you do, and many of you have heard me say this before, if you do a good study of this word, you will find that it is a word that represents a substance that causes plants to be green. And therefore, we should see it as a green horse, not pale, not spotted, not dappled, but simply green. And we learn from Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7 that there's going to be a time of trouble. And if you look at the previous verse, verse 6, we see men that are in pain as though they're having labor pains. Read all of that, that 30th chapter, the first seven verses. And their faces are turned and the word in Hebrew, although it's translated a variety of different ways, that word is the Hebrew word for green. Why? Green symbolizes pain. And let me stop for a moment and share with you that Satan and the Antichrist is really a type of Satan incarnate. The Antichrist, like Satan, what do they love? Adversity. That's what the name Satan means. And that is pain, causing pain and suffering for the purpose of pain and suffering. They rejoice over the misery and the suffering of others. And that is what this, this fourth horseman is being described as. Look again. That, that fourth horse or that fourth living creature says, come and see. And I looked and behold a green horse, and the one who sat upon it having a name. And what was its name? Death. Now, Messiah says, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Our God is the living God. And what we see here has nothing in these seal judgments. It has nothing to do with God. In other words, what we're talking about here and the origin of all these things is not God. It does not represent his wrath or his judgment. None of that has happened yet. It says here that the name that this one had was death. And we see that hell followed literally with him. So he was connected to hell. And that is a satanic clue. And it says he was given authority to kill on a quarter of the earth. Now, remember that first horseman, that white horseman? He went out conquering. And we see here that this one is going to rule over a fourth of the earth. Most scholars see that as a fourth being the land, all of the land. And we know that the Antichrist empire is going to be a world empire. We'll see that another proof of that tomorrow. So he's going to rule over a fourth of the earth. And how is he going to do that? It says with a sword. Now, that's significant because we see that that second horseman on that red horse is going to go out and take peace. And he was given what? A sword. And then when we look at that black horse, the horseman was on that had to do with high prices, which relates to a famine. And we see here that also a famine is mentioned and then death and also by the beasts of the earth. When do beasts of the earth come? When there's famines, when there's natural disasters or when there's pestilence, they come in to, to society. And what the scripture is doing here is uniting that fourth horseman with the first three. They form a unit. They are one issue. And what we see here is that these four horsemen, they bring about a change in the world. They remove peace. They, they bring about a time of instability. And all of that, the Antichrist is going to use in order to gain control over the world. Now, what is so important that we see is this. When Daniel's 70th week comes in, we see that, that the fifth seal 
is going to be what we should be looking at. Why? I've already shared with you. The Antichrist, he is going to manifest himself in a time of stability. What's the basis for that? Well, I mentioned to you several times the importance of Revelation chapter 13. Do you know what Revelation 13 is? It's kind of an overview of what has been revealed in the book of Revelation in the previous chapters. It goes back and look at what's going to happen. And what we find is this. There's going to be a beast. That's that empire. And that beast is going to come out of instability. And that beast is the Antichrist empire. He is going to rise up in a time of instability, but he is going to defeat the cause of that one, and that's the ram, who is the source of instability. He's going to bring about and use all of that to establish his empire. And then we find later on in the book of Revelation and in chapter 13, there's another beast. But that beast, although it is wicked, it looks like a lamb. And we find that that second beast, which comes not out of the sea, you see the sea represents instability. The sea is turbulent. It's moving all the time. So the Antichrist empire comes out of instability. He is going to secure things, make things stable. And what's going to happen? Only after that will the Antichrist manifest himself because when you look at Revelation 13, that second beast who is indeed the Antichrist, he comes out of the land, stable times. And he is going to bring about a spiritual change. We'll talk about that later on. But let's get the picture. We see that Iran's going to rise up, bringing about instability. The goat, that is the Antichrist empire, will put him down and bring about a time of, of stability. But that Antichrist empire is a blasphemous character. And therefore, believers, true believers, will speak against this. And what's going to happen because we stand for righteousness and truth and we want to enforce the character of God, that is what we should want. God's character, this, this God who is holy and righteous and good and just. Well, those things are going to be punished by the Antichrist. And that's why we saw in, in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 9, that we will be delivered over to tribulation. And then if we go to the fifth seal, the fifth seal is about believers, those who, and what does the scripture say? Well, let's look at it carefully. Look with me to that sixth chapter of the book of, of Revelation, Revelation chapter 6. Look at the fifth seal and what is said there. What is going to happen? It says, when he opened up the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain. And why were they slain? For the word of God and the testimony which they held. So there's going to be that same persecution. Now, the question that we have to answer is this. Are those who are being persecuted and put to death based upon Matthew 24, verse 9? Are they tribulation saints, as we're so commonly told? Well, again, we're going to examine that question and to see if, in fact, that this is who we're speaking about, or are we speaking about believers in a general sense? So when Daniel's 70th week begins, those last seven years, we're going to see that believers are going to stand in opposition to the unrighteousness of this Antichrist empire and are going to be persecuted. And many are going to be put to death. Now, let me point out something about this last seven years, Daniel's 70th week, what many call the tribulation. And we'll see in a different message over this weekend, 
Is it appropriate to call those final seven years the tribulation? What is meant by that? Is that a biblical term? Do we find scriptural support for such a designation? But let me point out now that when we look at this 70th week of Daniel, those final seven years, we find that the scripture repeatedly, and here's this, hear that carefully, the scripture consistently breaks up this period into half. Sometimes it speaks about three and a half years and three and a half years. Other times it speaks about 42 months and 42 months. Other times it speaks about 1,260 days and 1,260. But a question that you should ask yourself is this. Why consistently in the scripture, especially in the book of Revelation, does John always breaks up these final seven years, Daniel's 70th week, into two different periods? The Bible does that. Why? What is the significance of that? Well, I want you to see something else in the scripture. Look with me now to uh, the book of Revelation. I've mentioned it several times, chapter 13. I want you to see something very important. And I would say that for the purpose of this conference and having a right view and understanding of the end times, what I'm going to share with you right now is of the utmost importance. Revelation chapter 13. Now, what we find here is something that, that is so significant. Chapter 13, and begin, if you would, with verse 5. Speaking about this Antichrist empire, what does it say? Verse 5. And he was given a mouth. That's that beast, that Antichrist empire. He was given a mouth speaking great things. Now, these great things aren't good things, but bold things and also things that are not pleasing to God. Why? Because also he speaks blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for how long? For 42 months. Now, this is so significant because we learned in the word of God that the Antichrist empire, he is going to be allowed to function for three and a half years. Speaking these bold things that are displeasing to God, carrying out this blasphemy, this unrighteous empire, he is going to be allowed to do that. Now, you know what one of the implications that is? We ought not think that all of Daniel's 70th week, all of those seven years are the wrath of God. By the way, make a note of this. And if you can prove that I'm wrong, I would love to be corrected in this. What I would say to you is this. There is no biblical support, no way to derive a, a, a from a passage in the scripture that all of Daniel's 70th week is the wrath of God. We're told right here that the Antichrist is able to carry on doing his evilness, speaking his, his blasphemy for 42 months. And what does he do during this time? Look at verse 6. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, that is the character of God, the righteousness of God, his tabernacle. Tabernacle is re re representing the presence of God. He hates the presence of God and those who dwell in heaven. Now, be very careful about something. When you do a good study of the book of Revelation, you'll find something. You will find that in the book of Revelation, there are two groups of people, those who dwell upon the earth and those who dwell in heaven. And it has nothing to do with where they are physically located. 
When John in the book of Revelation speaks about those who dwell upon earth, he's talking about those who belong to the earth, who are citizens of this world, of that Antichrist empire. While those who dwell in the heaven, here again, it's not because they're there. It's because they are committed to their citizenship in the kingdom of God. They are servants of God and believers in Messiah and committed to kingdom truth. So Revelation chapter 13 is very informative and it gets even clearer. Look. And he opened his mouth, this beast, this Antichrist empire, to blaspheme against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in the heaven. And it was granted to him, notice that, granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Now, you will find that, that many people, when they have their doctrine for the last days, they don't deal with that. And they'll say, well, these are our tribulation saints. There's no reason to think that. And I'll give you proof. Here's what I would like to share with you. One of the requirements of teaching the Bible is to study the Bible and to understand how the Bible is put together, the clues, the methodology for interpreting it rightly. Now, you will find that there's many who would say, those saints are not the church, but rather those who come to faith after the rapture. Well, we'll talk about that, and we'll see what the Bible says about that. But I want to share one thing with you. It says here, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him. Here's this verse that speaks about the Antichrist empire being all over the world, a one world government, where it says, authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And all who dwell on the earth, those are those who belong to this world and not the kingdom of God. All who dwell upon earth will worship him whose names had not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Now, those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, that is speaking about the church in the most general way. And then we have a clue. Look, if you would, to verse, verse 9. Now, in chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, we have those seven messages to those seven churches in Asia Minor. And to each church, we see something. We see that, that John wrote down the message, but the message for each of these congregations is from Messiah. And he says to each one of these churches, to him who have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to who? To the churches. So when we look at verse 9 here of Revelation 13, and it says, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. This ties us back to Revelation chapters 2 and 3. This is the way of John letting us know that those who he is going to make war with, those saints, are indeed the church. Not some other group, not some group of people that come to faith after the rapture. There's no reason to believe that. And again, we're going to be looking and dedicating an hour to studying that question. And that is, are there tribulation saints? Well, we've been taught that Daniel's 70th week is consistently broken up into two segments. Whether we deal with three and a half years and three and a half years, or 42 months and 42 months, or 1,260 days and 1,260 days. But in the middle, there's a very important event. And that event is the abomination of desolation. And we see that, that Messiah mentioned it. We see that Daniel spoke of it. 
And we see as well, Paul also talked of it. And when Messiah spoke of it, and I'll give you the location, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. He spoke to his disciples and he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, let the reader, that is the student, let the reader understand. And right after that event, there's a change. Beginning in the next verse, verse 16, no longer is the content of what Messiah is saying for the disciples but it's for those in Judea. And it speaks about a time of suffering, a time of trouble, the worst time of trouble. For who? For Israel. And why is the focus on Israel? Because in the previous verse, I'm speaking about verse 14 of Matthew 24. It says this, And the gospel of this kingdom must be proclaimed to all the nations as a testimony. And then the end will come. And what end? Again, this is the end of the church age. And he says to the church, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. What are we going to understand? Well, we'll find the answer to that question tomorrow when we look at what Paul says about that event called the abomination of desolation. So we see something. We see here that the the middle event is the abomination of desolation. And then after that, we see something. We see that soon thereafter, the abomination of desolation There's two things that the word of God says that there's going to be 144,000 from the tribes of Israel in Revelation chapter seven that are going to be sealed. And then we have an image of a group, a group from every language, every nation, every people and every tribe. Sounds like the church to me that are going to be taken into heaven and stand with with an acknowledgement of dependence upon God to stand before the throne of God, proclaiming salvation to God. I believe that is an image of the rapture. So after, hear this, after the abomination of desolation, a remnant of Israel's going to be sealed, and then we're going to see the rapture. No one knows the day or the hour. We don't know if it's a few hours after the sealing of Israel, a few days, a few weeks, a few months. No one knows. But we do know this, that the rapture must happen. When? Before the wrath of God. And we're going to see that in the book of Revelation, twice, that is going to be supported. What's going to be supported? What Paul teaches us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, where it says, you have not been appointed for wrath. Believers will never experience the wrath of God, never be in this world when God pours out his wrath. That's the promise that we have. And the error that so many people make is that they believe all of Daniel's 70th week, all of those final seven years, the wrath of God. We saw that's not the case. Because the Antichrist is going to have the authority to carry on and do his blasphemous things and persecute believers during the first half, those first 42 months. And then what do we know? Well, we know that that after the rapture, then and only then will God begin to pour out his wrath. And that wrath will come to an end with Messiah's second coming. It will be when Messiah returns the second time that he brings the final blow to this world, destroying the enemies of Israel. And that when he comes that second time, we know from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13, that believers are going to be with him because the scripture promises wherever he is, we will be forever. And it's only after that second coming that he is going to establish 
His kingdom, what kingdom? The millennial kingdom, where he will rule for a thousand years. So what we have seen is this. If you want to know the major events, we've studied them tonight. Iran is going to rise up. It's taking place before our eyes today. Iran is going to be a source of instability. But Iran will not accomplish its objectives. The Antichrist empire will destroy Iran. And the Antichrist, he is going to use the instability that is brought about by Iran, brought about through earthquakes, famines, and pestilence, and other wars. He is going to bring about a false stability. And he is going to establish his kingdom. And when he does so, this empire, this false kingdom, he is going to do so at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week where there will be that false treaty made with many. And during that first half of Daniel's 70th week, we're going to see believers, the church, persecuted. And then in the middle of that week, the abomination of desolation. And then after the abomination of desolation, the sealing of Israel, the rapture of the church, and then only after the rapture of the church, No man knows the day or the hour of that event. It's after the halfway point. We don't know how soon after. After the rapture, the wrath of God will be poured out through his trumpet judgments, through his bold judgments, and the wrath of God will come to an end with the second coming of Messiah, who will come and defeat in totality that Antichrist empire and establish his millennial kingdom. This is what the Bible reveals will happen in the last days. So my hope is this, that we will enjoy a study of a total of seven different messages over this conference. And we'll deal with things such as, what is the tribulation period? What is going to happen in the last days? Will the church see the Antichrist? Is the doctrine of imminency correct? And are there tribulation saints? And then we're going to conclude on Sunday morning with a special message, instructions for believers in light of the end times. What do we need to know to be found faithful? So that's our purpose for this conference. And my hope is that when we look at what's going on in Israel, we can see that things are moving quickly in this world. Changes are happening, but that we won't be deceived. We won't be weighed down with the cares of this world. We will not have ourselves being turned away from the truth, but that we will be people that are committed to the word of God and have the testimony of Messiah being demonstrated in our life by word and by deed. This is the purpose of our conference. Well, I'll conclude our first message at this time. May God bless you.